Acts the 16th chapter, verses 16 through 34. If you found it, would you just say amen? amen. If you have not, just join in reading with someone. I'm going to read it to you aloud. The version that I'm reading may be a slight variation than the one that you have, but it is, I am sure, I assure you rather, it is nonetheless the word of the Lord. And it reads as follows. One day, as we were going down to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit that enabled her to tell the future. She earned a lot of money for her masters by telling fortunes. She followed Paul and the rest of us shouting, These men are servants of the Most High God, and they've come to tell you how to be saved. Now this went on day after day until Paul got so exasperated that he turned and said to the demon within her, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And instantly it left her. Well, her masters, in verse 19, her master's hopes of wealth were now shattered. So they grabbed Paul and Silas, dragged them before the authorities in the middle of town in the marketplace. In verse 20, the whole city is in an uproar because of these Jews, they shouted to the city officials. They are teaching customs that are illegal for us Romans to practice. A mob quickly formed against Paul and Silas, and the city officials ordered them stripped and beaten with wooden rods. Look at verse 23. They were severely beaten, and then they were thrown into prison. The jailer was ordered to make sure they didn't escape. In verse 24, so the jailer put them into the inner dungeon, the inner dungeon, the inner dungeon, and clamped their feet in the stocks. Around midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the other prisoners were listening in. And the Bible says in verse 26, suddenly, suddenly there was a massive earthquake. And the prison was shaken to its foundation. All the doors immediately flew open. The chains of every prisoner fell off. The jailer woke up to see the prison doors wide open and he assumed, my goodness, everybody has escaped. So he drew his sword to kill himself, but Paul shouted, stop! Don't kill yourself. We're still here. We're all here. The jailer called for lights and ran to the dungeon and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and asked, sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. Not just you, but everybody in your household. And they shared this word of the Lord with him and with all that were in his household. And even at that hour of the night, the jailer cared for them and washed their wounds. Then he and everyone in the household were immediately baptized. He brought them into his house, set a meal before him. He and his entire household rejoiced because they all believed. Let's pray. Father God, in the name of Jesus. It is my task to do this again, and I have been sent by you, and so it is that I am capable and competent and qualified to handle this responsibility, not by my own might nor strength, but by your power, and by the power of your Holy Spirit that worketh within me. So have your magnificent, marvelous way and do it again. Move in this place like never before. Let us see another level of glory. And God, let us hear from on high. Give us an anointing. Give me an anointing that makes preaching this easy and listening even easier. And don't let any of us leave here the same way that we came, but let us leave increased and better in Jesus' name. Let the redeemed of the Lord say amen. amen. You may be seated in the presence of our awesome God. While you're on your way down, push your neighbor, touch him on the shoulder, whatever you got to do to get their attention, but tell him, look up. Some of y'all didn't do it. I'm looking at you. <laughs> Push somebody, touch them, get their attention. Try the other side this time. Tell them, look up. Yeah, look up. Now you did it. Look up. I will lift up mine eyes to the hills from which cometh my help. All of my help comes from the Lord. I will lift up mine eyes to the hills from whence cometh my help. Why? Because all of my help comes from where? 
comes from the Lord. If you have just joined us for the first time in this month, we have been embarking upon a series called Unstoppable. And in that we have declared that we are victory and we are unstoppable. Yeah, we have declared it not just by verbiage, not just by the articulation of our words and the usage of our language, but we have declared it in our faith and our favor. We have declared it in our ability, our tenacity, our zeal, our passion, our hunger to make sure that we see God's purpose manifested and fulfilled in our lives. We truly are victory, and yes, we are unstoppable. I am confident by this time we have figured out that in the life of Paul, there are some extraordinary examples of what it is to be unstoppable. Paul was no stranger to pain. He was no stranger to trial, to tribulation, to problems, to sorrow, to weakness. Paul was no stranger to having some bad days. But Paul seemed to have within himself an innate zeal to not let anything or anyone deter him. He had committed himself, to, he had convicted his mind to believe beyond a shadow of a doubt that he was unstoppable. He was relentless. He was tenacious. He was absolutely determined that everything God said he would have, everything God said he would do, he would accomplish, and he would have. In addition to that, he was no stranger to opposition. Paul, however, had concluded within himself that it didn't matter what opposed him, if God before him, he was more than whatever it was that came against him. To be unstoppable, again, is not an act, but it is a mindset. It is your capacity to think and believe beyond a shadow of a doubt and to hope even against hope that even though the devil throws task throws his daunting darts at you even though the devil does everything that he can to derail your potential and kill your possibility you have a mindset that though he slay me yet will I still trust in God and I am unstoppable to be unstoppable again is not just an act to be unstoppable is a mindset that nothing comes against you that your God cannot handle Paul had exemplified on numerous occasions Asians, what it was to have the enemy come against him but to still be determined if you recall Paul's track record his history uh, if you look at the lineage of what he came through and where he came from you remember that the record records that he'd been beaten he had been whipped flogged he had been pr in prison he had been shipwrecked three times he had been hungry he had been cold he has had his enemies come at him he has had his friends come against him Paul had been through a lot of stuff but Paul had the endurance and the perseverance to be an overcomer. Here it is. To be unstoppable is not just a mindset, but it is the capacity of your mind to move and exercise its efforts to move your body and your physicality to a circumstance or situation that you are able to look at your problems and know that they have been subdued. Did I lose anybody? Look at your neighbor and say, no child left behind. We got you. Yeah, here's how it goes. This is what it is. It, it, it doesn't matter if the devil throws his best punch at you. To be an overcomer doesn't mean that he doesn't always miss or that he always misses. Sometimes those punches land. And when they land, you've got to roll with the punches. Do I have any help in here yet? All right, I see I got to make it plain. No child left behind. Come on and go with me. Yeah, it, it doesn't mean that you're always going to get away from the enemy's attacks. Sometimes you get caught in the enemy's attack. And if you are here today, you can testify it has not always been sunshine. But just like Paul, you've had some cloudy days and some days when the enemy landed a few of those punches. And can I testify when he hits you, it feels like he has unleashed hell against you and it absolutely hurts. Anybody that fakes the funk and plays like they don't have moments when pain hurts, something is wrong with you. You have a false sense of reality because pain will make you tell the truth. Pain will cause you to step back and say, wait a minute, I thought I was a believer, but I ain't felt nothing quite like this. I know I got a prayer life. I know, come on and don't tell, don't be super saints on me today, but you too have had moments when you've had to step back, scratch your 
your head and say, wait a minute, did I really sign up for this? Am I really cut out for this? But the thing that I celebrate is that the fact that you are sitting here today, come on somebody, you are evidence of what it is to be an overcomer because I need you to be very clear. The devil didn't mean for those punches to hurt you, but the Bible says that he roams throughout the land seeking whom he may devour. And to devour means to utterly and totally consume so that there's no evidence you ever even existed. He doesn't come to wound you, but he came to kill, steal, and destroy. But the fact that you are sitting in this sanctuary today gives me great hope that I got some overcomers in here today. Some people that have overcome. What do you mean overcome? You have come over. You have subdued the things that came to subdue you. You have overcome depression. Some of you have overcome some haters nipping at your heels. Some of you have overcome losing your job. Some of you have overcome almost losing your mind. Some of you have overcome the enemy trying to tell you what you will not do. Do I have overcomers in here? Make some. Make some noise. Yeah. Slap your neighbor and say, he is preaching about me today. I don't know if you done figured it out, but he is telling my story. I've had hell, but I made it. I've been through pain, but I made it. It's been rough, but I made it. I've had some tests, but I made it. I had to deal with the stuff by myself, but I made it. I was crying sometimes, but I made it. I was crawling sometimes, but I made it. But by the grace of God, barely, but I'm Slap somebody high five and say, I am an overcomer. I have overcome some stuff because God has overcome the world. Paul was no stranger to what it was to live as an overcomer. Paul understood very clearly, definitively. He understood that to be an overcomer, he had to have an unstoppable mindset. Paul was not like any of us, was much like rather many of us in that Paul had his own personal goals, his own personal dreams and aspirations. But the thing that made Paul unstoppable above everything else is that he desired above all things to please God. He wanted God to be pleased and he wanted to exercise in such a way that God would be honored by what he had done. It wasn't that Paul was absent or void within the track record of his life. Of, no, of days that he disappointed God just like many of us he made mistakes and he had a past he had history he had some junk in his trunk he had a closet that he didn't want anybody opening the door to I'm trying to call your name without calling your name I'm trying to say Paul but really I understand it's you I'm talking about you can quit faking with me take the price tag off don't get brand new don't make me prophesy and start telling all your business up in here because the truth be told you look good on the outside but you've been through hell and back and if anybody knew what you would come from they would understand why you praising and why it takes all of that today yeah, I got a whole house full of used to be's. You used to be a dope dealer. You used to be a pimp prostitute. You used to be in the nightclub. You used to be lascivious. You used to be a hater. You used to be a whoremonger. You used to be on drugs. You, I got a whole list of used to be's up in here. Don't front. Slap your neighbor and say, you better quit fronting in here. He telling your business. You said it was about you, right? It's about you today. Paul had the decision to make because Paul had a mindset to go and please God. Paul had traveled the regions of the earth in the, in the area of, of Greece and Athens, and he had gone uh, in Rome. He had spent much time ministering the gospel. He had set up churches in Corinth and in Galatia and at Philippi. He had set up uh, ministries and organizations. He had, he had literally organized churches in the name of Jesus Christ, and he had had great favor and great success. It didn't mean that it was without problems because if you go to any church, you're going to have some problems that arise in the church. Amen. I don't care. That's why y'all can stop church hopping because if you leave this one, wherever you go, there you are. Yeah, it ain't that when you show up, every church just develop problems automatically or they had problems when you got there. But some of them problems you taking because you won't sit down and be where God desires for you to be. That's a side note. I just threw that in there for free. 
But Paul was unlike, he was most like, many like, most like, much like rather, many of us in that Paul had his own desire, but uh, Paul was uh, wise enough. He was, he, was, he was astute enough in his faith that he sought the Lord's will. Well, Paul was deciding, where do I go next? Where do I plant a church? Where, where should I go? What territory should I go to? And he had looked at all the regions in the north and all the regions in the east, and he was looking, should I go here? Should I go there? And in the course of his desiring to please God, he never stopped moving. He never stopped ministering. He never stopped serving. He never stopped working. Paul was, un he understood that to wait on God didn't mean to sit down and just wait for God to drop something mysteriously into your lap. But to wait on God meant to work diligently until God sends his will and his word and gives you your direction. Are y'all with me so far? So watch this. Paul is in the dream. In the middle of the dream, he has a vision. A man comes to him in the vision, and he acknowledged and recognized the lineage or the heritage or the culture of the man by the bone structure within his face and by the vernacular or by the dialect in which he spoke. And he realized that this man was from Macedonia. And in this dream, this man says to him through the power of the Holy Spirit, we need you to move to Macedonia, and this is the territory that you need to now set up camp and do ministry in because Macedonia needs your help. Now, Paul, of course, being one who followed the will of God in this season of his life, Paul didn't buck it. He didn't fight it. He didn't go against it. Paul recognized that even though it may not line up with what I want, God, his will, his plan, his strategy is always going to work out better for my life. If you want to be unstoppable, you need to adopt that mindset and embrace that reality even for your own self. That wherever you go, as long as you are going in God's will, it will always be better for your life. Quit trying to tell God what you want to do and start asking God, God, what do you want for me to do? Quit trying to give God your wish list as if he is some cosmic Santa Claus telling him what you want to accomplish and where you want to be assigned and say, God, where would you have me to be assigned? Because I have figured out in my, my, my years of living, I have figured out in this short lifetime that if I tell God where I want to go and I force myself into the place that I desire for myself, it's going to be hell when I get there. Come on and testify somebody. You have forced yourself into some circumstances and situations only to get in there and say, this ain't what I signed up for. I thought it was going to be different. When I came in, he smelled good. He looked good. He had muscles popping out all over the place. But now he don't have a job. He don't have a car. And he's trying to live off the fruit of my labor. I know I got some testimonies. I'm looking at you, but you can't say amen because you're still sitting by him right now. That's all right. I got your back. I'll say it for you. Amen. Yeah, you signed up for the job because they gave you all these benefits and they told you how peachy keen it was going to be and how you were going to have all these off days. But you didn't know that the person you would be working for is a stone cold fool and is going to treat you like you are a subjected servant and not someone who has the astute benefits of giftings that you have in your trunk. Do I have any testimonies in here that people have signed up for something but you got in and said this ain't what I signed up? for. Paul understood that to sign up for something that was outside of God's will would ultimately lead him to depression and to heartache. So Paul, he signed up to go where God wanted him to go. Now Paul had had great he had had great success and favor in Rome where he was ministering all over Rome, Corinth, uh, Corinthian, the Corinthians, uh, uh, the church of Galatia, the, the church of Philippi. He had had great favor and success. The people embraced the message. Again, it was not without problems. However, ultimately and, and, and at the conclusion of it, they really readily embraced the gospel message and he was able to amass enough people that he constituted it as a church in these locations. Paul thought that when he got his new assignment, which was Macedonia, that Macedonia would receive him in the same way. Here's the challenge. Paul got, got to Macedonia only to find out that every one of his attempts and efforts were being met with extraordinary opposition. They did not desire to hear his message and he was not received in the way that he was, he was accustomed to being received. Here's Paul's thing, however. Paul was relentless in his effort. He was not deterred and he refused to be denied. 
it didn't matter whether they received him or not. He knew he was standing on the promises of God and that if God sent him to this territory, there was a purpose for it and ultimately God's promises would be manifested. I want to hurry up and forewarn you that just because you are following in God's will doesn't mean everything is going to go your way. Some of us, we have this mindset, this false ideology, this crazy theology that we believe if God told us to do it and we jump into it, that everything is just going to automatically fall into place. If you jump into God's will, instantaneously you are drawing fire from the enemy. So everything cannot just fall into place because you are being met with extraordinary opposition. Don't think that just because God told you to do it, that it's going to be a cakewalk and you just going to walk right into it. Anything that God God gives you an assignment to do however you can be tenacious in doing it because he's also going to give you the grace to handle the pressure or the fire that's going to come in your direction Paul was no stranger to pain and Paul understood that I got to go through this because in order for me to accomplish the goal that is before me, I got to minister here in this place called Macedonia. Now here it is. Macedonia is a hotbed. It is a central location. It is a hub for trade and Macedonia was an important city. It had cultural context and relevance that, that, that surpassed or even uh, amassed the same kind of regard as Rome did with its political structure and its political acclaim. It was a place Place where a lot of streets and rivers and streams and, and, and ocean ways came through it. It was a place by which commerce was done on a continual basis and it was a place that knew many dialects. It was known for the historical value of its dialects and its languages that came to the table. So it was important for Paul to go into this region because in this region he would have impact and influence over everything, every crevice, every crack, every corner of the earth because it was from this hub that the information was being dis dissipated or disseminated across the globe. So it makes sense to me that now Paul would ultimately be sent to Macedonia. But what doesn't make sense to most of us is why would God send me to Macedonia and then have me go through the pain that I have to go through? Why would he allow me to go here, give me this assignment? I understand the logic behind it. I see the rationale. I see the benefit of it. I know what God is doing but why would he send me into this territory and then turn around and allow me to deal with the opposition that I'm dealing with? I mean this is some extraordinary pain that's being inflicted upon me. Well let me testify and help some of you understand some of the pain that you are dealing with don't even have nothing to deal with you. Some of the stuff you go through has nothing to do with you. It has everything to do with people around you needing to see that you are an overcomer. Because Revelations 12 and 11 says we overcome by the power of the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. The reason you are going through it is because God has entrusted that there's something inside of you that he has recognized. Come in, Job and testify. Something about your character, your personality, something about your integrity, your faith that causes God to say I trust that if anybody is going to praise me under pressure that this is a person that I can count on that's going to give me glory even when the enemy comes against me so you should be excited. That's why the scripture says, think it not strange concerning the fiery trials, which are to try you as though some strange thing has happened. You should be excited that God chose you, that he allowed you. It is not that he inflicted upon you because his thoughts are not to harm you, but to prosper you, to give you a hope and a future. It is not God himself that implemented the action against you, but it is God that removed the hedge because he saw something in you that he needed to work out of you. If you hadn't gone through what you went through, you would never understand who you really are under pressure. Can I preach it like I feel it today? I just feel like the Holy Ghost is about to liberate somebody in this place. The hell that you're going through is not to break you. It is to make you. It is not to kill you. It is to increase you. You should be grateful that God thinks enough of you to allow you to be attacked the way that you're being attacked because it means that he sees something on the inside that is work that is far greater than what's working on on the outside. Can I say it a different way? Let me say it like this. What's in you is greater than what's upon you. Yeah. Slap somebody high five and say, I told you you're preaching about me today. Because if you knew what I've been through. 
you would understand why I say he preaching to me today. See, it takes a different kind of Christian. It takes, a, it takes a, 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 an immature Christian to be able to thank God when all things are well. But you really have to be mature in your faith to be able to praise God even when pressure has hit your life. Yeah, anybody can thank God when you got money in the bank. But can you thank God when you don't know where your next bit of money is going to come from? Anybody can praise God when your health is good. But can you praise God that you are going through sickness and you just believe by the confidence of God's word that your health is going to turn around for your good? Yeah, it takes a different kind of Christian to be able to praise God under pressure. So one would ask, why did he let Paul go through this? Well, because Paul had to exemplify and embody what it was in this territory, dealing with these extraordinary circumstances. Paul was attacked beyond measure, but it was because God had confidence that Paul was going to come out of this thing as an uplooker. Yeah, too many of us, we don't understand what it means to be an uplooker. An uplooker doesn't have to be in an up situation to look up. Come on, here, somebody. An uplooker can be in the deepest, darkest hole and still see sunlight because they will not take their eyes off the sun that's shining down in its hole. Come on, can I talk to like I feel it? There's somebody in this place today who has gotten into a dark situation, but I, I came to tell you that if you're looking for the light. The light is not going to be found in a vertical fashion. It's going in a horizontal fashion, but it's going to be found in a vertical fashion. If you find the capacity within yourself to keep looking up, I don't care what is going on around me. I'm still looking up. I, I don't care what my haters say about it. I'm still looking up. I don't care that my circumstance is pointing down. I'm still going to look up. Why are you looking up? Have you ever walked into a room and somebody was looking up something mysterious happens because just because somebody is looking up everybody that walks in and sees them looking up they start looking up too trying to figure out what are we looking at and what are we looking for well I'm looking up today and I know you're trying to figure out what I'm looking at let me help you understand I'm looking at your miracle I'm looking at your breakthrough I'm looking at your next level I'm looking at your elevation I'm looking up your promotion. I will lift up mine eyes to the hills from which cometh my help. Oh, my help comes from the Lord. Where my uplookers just holler, up? Uh? That's me. I'm talking about me. So let's look at Paul's attacks. Because I believe in this will be your liberty. You've got to understand that the enemy has strategy to his efforts. He is crafty which means that he is strategic or he thinks his attacks through. That's why what he hits you with, he won't hit me with. And what he hits me with, he may not hit you with. Because he's not going to waste his time on attacks that he does not think will be successful. So you got to understand that when the enemy attacks you, he attacks you with a strategic mindset. And that's why we have to understand that, that we are not ignorant is what the word says. We are not ignorant of Satan's devices. We know how he works because the Bible gives us a clear depiction of his strategy and his motivation. It is to kill, steal, and destroy. So let's look at for a moment how they attacked Paul. First of all, uh, Paul understood he was never out of options. But it didn't mean that the enemy didn't try to do what the enemy wanted to do. The first thing that they did, there was a little girl that was following behind Paul. And Paul was not oblivious to her because she was shouting the whole time. These are the men of the Most High God. Listen, they're trying to tell you how to be saved. Now, from all practical purposes, one would be excited because this was a marketing tool. This little girl was celebrating that these were men of God and they were, they were speaking words of truth that would help people to be saved. So it, it, automatically you would conclude, one would think, that this must be an awesome opportunity because uh, this little girl, this innocent little girl, is shouting the good news about we being men of God and that we're telling them how to be saved. I, I was baffled and bewildered as to why it frustrated Paul or why he was exasperated, why he turned around and got fed up and even spoke. Well, and I figured out Paul had spiritual discernment. Paul had a relationship with God and God gave him the capacity not to be fooled 
by the appearance or the packaging of the message. Y'all got that? Sometimes the enemy will, not even sometimes, every time, the enemy will package his vices in such a way that it deceives you or fools you into a false sense of security. Oh, this is going to be good. Let me help you understand what it looks like. Just because the job looks good doesn't mean that it's a godsend for your life. Y'all heard it this way. Everything that glitters ain't gold. Everything that got muscles Uh, bye, bye, bye. I felt the Holy Ghost right there. Everything that wears a short skirt and has a figure like a Coke bottle. Don't do it. Save yourself. Don't do it. Jump ship now. It ain't too late. Paul figured out this little girl. Now, it is not, it is not by chance that the enemy used a little girl disarming them with the innocence of a child. One would immediately think, oh, this is just a little girl. Oh, that's so sweet. She, she's going around telling us. But Paul wasn't fooled because Paul had a relationship with God. So therefore, he had spiritual discernment. In addition to this, Paul turned around and he spoke to the demonic spirit and said, come out of her. See, here's the deal. Paul figured out everybody is not qualified to speak over me. Just because it looks like God, just because it sounds like God, just because it's on TV, doesn't mean that they have the qualifications or they have the assignment to speak into my life. Paul was clear that whatever, def whatever defines you controls you. So if the little girl with the demonic spirit defined them by saying these are the men of the most high God, then the little girl was actually trying to exercise control over them. But Paul was so keen in his spiritual discernment that he turned around and said, you do not have the qualifications to speak into my life. Everybody else probably would have been bewildered and baffled trying to figure out why would you get rid of this free marketing? You ain't even got to pay this little girl. She just dragging behind you and she's advertising, telling people that you're trying to get them saved. And isn't that not what you're trying to do? Yes, it's what I'm trying to do. But what I don't need is for a fake amen corner to be over here cheering for me on one corner and trying to kill my efforts on the other corner. You got to be careful about everybody that says amen because everybody that says amen ain't saying it about you. Oh, I know you're sitting by them and they're on your road. Just say amen and look up. So watch this, watch this. So Paul turns around and he didn't deal with the girl. He spoke to the demonic spirit. Come on! Of her and immediately the spirit had to be obedient because he commanded the spirit in the name that is above every other name Jesus Christ that spirit had to be obedient to his command quit being sissified saints did I say that out loud I meant to quit being pushovers to the enemy. Quit being weak warriors in this army and start commanding the enemy to leave your stuff alone. You got to understand that the power of life and death is in your mouth. Turn around and speak to it. I command you in the name of Jesus. My kids will not be on the streets. I command you in the name of Jesus. You will leave my family. I command you in the name of Jesus. My spouse will be delivered. I command you to come out. You will not invade my body. The devil is a lie in Jesus' name. Commanded the spirit to come out. The spirit came out. Here's the problem. Everybody is not happy about your deliverance. And everybody is not respectful of your authority. The people that were making money off of her ability to tell the future through this demonic spirit, they were angry. They drug Paul in and brought him before the crowd. Now here's the first problem. When they attacked Paul, one of the first strategies, tactics, vices, devices of the enemy was that they brought him before the public. 
The enemy wants nothing more than to attack your name. Because if he can attack your name, he will attack your credibility. People will not listen to the words that are coming out of your mouth, even though you're proclaiming the truth of the gospel because your name is being drugged through the mud. Oh, come on, I can testify up in here. I figured out that what people want to do more than anything else is this what the enemy wants to do rather more than anything else because people ain't your problem. We wrestle not with flesh and blood, Ephesians 6 and 12, but the enemy wants to destroy your name. Proverbs 22 and 1 says a good name is more desirable than great riches is to be esteemed higher than silver and to go and gold. The enemy is a false accuser of the brethren according to Revelations 12 and 10. It makes it very clear that he's not going to come and sing your praises but the enemy is going to try to paint a picture that causes you to look lower than the earth. Then it goes on so far in John 8 and 44 to say when he lies he speaks in his native language. For the Satan is a liar and he is not just a liar, he is the father of lies. So think it not strange when people are castigating your name. They're trying to destroy your name because they're trying to disqualify your testimony. But what I figured out is I've never seen the righteous forsaken. Yeah, yeah. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them from them all and he will uphold me with his right hand of righteousness as long as I am in right standing with God they can talk about and destroy my name all they want to but as long as I'm lifting up the name of Jesus his name will stand even when they try to destroy my name not only did they try to destroy his name, the enemy wants to do nothing more than to drag your name through the mud. That's why they're lying behind your back trying to talk about you in the break room, stabbing you every chance that they get. It's the enemy that's trying to destroy the credibility of your name. But he cannot destroy the credibility of the name that you are proclaiming, and that is Jesus Christ. Not only did they drag him before the crowd, but if you notice that once the crowd got involved, they decided that they were going to beat him across his back. Now, the reason that they beat him across his back was in an effort to break his will. Whenever you break someone's will, they then become just like a mule or an ass or oxen or a horse or a camel. They become a, bur a, beaten, a, a beast of burden. When you want to break the will of a wild horse, a stallion, or, 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 or a, a, a wild horse that is running free, you've got to break their capacity to think like they are liberated. You do not want them to be liberated in their mind, but you want them to submit to having the burden of something or someone on their back. Whenever you're trying to, to break a wild Mustang, the first thing that they try to do is figure out the intellectual capacity of the Mustang. Is the Mustang strong-willed enough to believe in its mind that it's going to be liberated and free to do whatever it wants to do and refuse to have something on its back? Or is it now weak-minded that they'll be able to use certain strategies and tactics to break the will of the horse so that, or the, so that anything or anybody can ride on its back and be a burden on the back of the horse? See, understand that when the enemy is able to break your will, he causes you to lose your zeal and your passion for liberty. And then you become a permanent burden bearer or something permanently becomes encroached upon your back but here's the thing that I need you to understand beloved at the end of the day you were not meant to be beasts of burden you have been meant to be liberated and free to do whatever it is God has given you instructions and assignment to accomplish so the enemy is beating you across your back because he knows that if he beats you down long enough eventually you're going to bend over and succumb and then the devil is going to place depression and sickness and anxiety and stress on your back and you become just like that wild horse. You become tamed and you become submitted to being a beast.
beast of burden. But this is what I want you to understand, that he whom the Son sets free, if God has liberated you, he says you were not created to have anything on your back. As a matter of fact, the battles that you are trying to fight, they're not even yours to fight. They belong to me. I have already overcome the world. So the stuff that you are dealing with in the world, it should not be a hindrance because God has already made provision. Not only did they beat him over his back to try to break his will, but they put him in a dark room. See, understand that when they brought him into the prison, they didn't put him in the outskirts of the prison. They didn't put him anywhere where there were lights or cell that had windows. They didn't put him where the rest of the prisoners were, but they put them in the inner court, the inner sanctum of the prison. prison. They wanted to ensure that there was no chance of Paul nor Silas escaping from their circumstance. So they put them in a dark inner circle or inside room within the prison. See, the, the other thing that the enemy wants to destroy, he not only wants to break your will, he's not only going to drag your name through the mud, but the enemy wants to put out your vision. He wants to put out your ability to be able to see yourself in the future looking so much better than you look right now. Proverbs 29 and 18 says, where there's no vision, the people perish. See, don't lose your sight just because the lights went out. You, you, let me let you sit with that for a moment because some of you, the enemy has turned the lights out in your life and it looks hopeless and you feel helpless, but don't lose your sight. Don't stop seeing yourself in the place that God has already promised you because irregardless of the lights, you've got to understand that God has an ability to let through his word a lamp come unto your feet and a light be on your pathway so that you'll be led into his marvelous light and you'll be able to realize and materialize everything that God has promised for your life. His word is a lamp unto your feet. It is a light until, unto your pathway. Here's the thing I figured out about God is that God still grows things in dark places. Yeah, because he himself leads them to the marvelous light and he himself is the light of the world. God still has the capacity to grow things even in dark places. I don't get messed up when I'm going through a dark season because I just know it's God's opportunity to grow some things that can't be developed in the sunlight. Are y'all with me, somebody? Here, let me help you out. Some things only grow in the dark. There are some species of plants that only function and thrive in dark places. Humans grow in the darkness of the womb. Seeds are germinated when they are placed into the dark crevices of the ground. Pictures, they come out beautiful, but before they ever make it to a place where you can enjoy the beauty of the picture, they have to go through a room that they call the dark room. And until they go through the dark room, if the light is introduced prematurely then the whole picture will be messed up. Some of you are going through a dark season right now. Well God just told me to tell you that he's developing some things in your life and if they come into the light too soon it'll mess up the whole picture. If you don't believe me look at the wings of a butterfly. They are multifaceted and multicolored. They are beautiful but before they unfurl and become the thing of beauty that we can observe on the outside. They have to spend some time in the darkness of a cocoon. They have to work their way out until they're capable and ready of unfurling their wings toward the light. Well, some of you are being grown up right now. God is expanding and enlarging your territory. You don't believe it and you don't see it because you're in a dark place. But I came to tell you today in 2015 that even though it's a dark room, He's just developing your next level. And when you come out of this dark place, everybody around you will have to take note. My God, you look better than you looked last year. You look healthier than you looked last year. You look more prosperous than you looked last year. Where my saints that are only on your way to your next level? God uses darkness to increase our faith. And your faith grows even in the midst of a dark trial. Not only did they drag his name through the mud. Not only did they try to break his will by beating him across his back. 
Not only did they try to kill his, ab his ability to operate in vision by putting him in a dark space in the prison, but they then went so far as to lock his feet in chains. They locked his feet in chains to try to stop his authority. Because when God gives a promise, he gives you the authority to walk in that promise. Yeah, yeah, some people can't take your, your, your authority. They don't like the way you walk. Because when you walk, you walk with confidence. You don't walk like, and I think I can, Christian. You walk like, I know I can, Christian. When you walk in a room, you change the atmosphere. Because you walk with such confidence. Understand that when Jesus was 12, he cracked the scrolls of the, uh, in the temple and he began to read. And the, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the dignitaries, the grown-ups in the place looked at him and marveled. And they said, whose baby boy is this? Because they could not understand how is he talking with such authority. See, when you know that 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 you know, you don't have to ask anybody permission to be who God has called you to be. But you walk with such confidence and authority because you know I'm on my way somewhere. I may not be where I'm going, but I promise you I'm going to get there. I may not look like I'm supposed to look, but I promise you I'm going to get there. See, they tried to diminish his authority by locking his feet in chains. But to walk in God's authority is to walk with the confidence that everything God promised, every promise that he made, I'm going to have what God has said. When the children of Israel walked in the promise of God, they walked out of bondage and they marched into their freedom. They marched out of Egypt, got to a wall of the Red Sea and had the enemy behind them. He opened up the sea. And they marched across the Red Sea. When they got into the wilderness, they sent spies to take a hike over the mountainside. Go into Canaan and spy out the land and tell us what you see. When they marched back into the territory, they said, I see a land flowing with milk and honey. All the generations of people that had come before had lost their ability to march because their feet were still tied up in Egypt. And because of this, only Joshua and Caleb out of millions of people were able to march into the promised land with the next generation. But even when they got to the promised land, the enemy had tried to lock them in chains. He tried to lock up their feet, their capacity to move. But God says, I need you to unshackle yourself because there's a wall that you're going to come to at Jericho. And despite how fortified this city is, all you got to do is kick your shackles off and begin to march. And as long as you've got the ability to march with the authority and the confidence that I've given you a promise that everything on the inside, it already belongs to you. Now, it might look foolish and people are going to look at you crazy, but the confidence that you march in has to be so convincing that it causes your enemies on the inside to get nervous and say, you must not know about me. Somebody should tell you I'm marching because I understand what I'm about to walk into is going to be greater than anything that I've ever seen in my life. Do I have any marchers up in this place? Watch this. They drug his name through the mud. They beat him on his back to break his will. They locked him up on the inner, inner, inside of the prison in a dark room try to destroy his vision. They chained his feet, try to diminish his authority. But then they went so far as to arrest him and chain up his hands to try to kill his power. See, what you got to understand is that you got some power in your hands. H have you ever seen the commercial that played it some years ago during the Super Bowl? There was a little boy who had on a Darth Vader suit. And he walked out there to his daddy's car. And he was trying to use the force to start the car. And so his daddy had a remote starter on the car. He was standing on the inside in the window. He had on his whole Darth Vader suit. His daddy saw him. And his daddy said, listen, 
I got to make this boy's day. Because he thinks this power is in his hands. So one time, the last time the little boy reached out towards the car, he said, and his daddy hit the remote start button. And the engine of the car came on. It startled the little boy. He jumped back. But the thing that I love is that he looked. You mean to tell me that I got all of that? Locked up inside my hands? That when I stretch my hands towards something? That God is standing over the balconies of heaven with a remote starter. I got to show my baby that they got power in the hands. You got to understand that when God wanted to bring, bring miracles about, that he allowed the disciples to use the power of their hands. They laid hands on the lame. They laid hands on the deaf and the dumb. And they laid hands on the sick. And even now the Bible says that if you call for the elders and they lay hands on the sick, that the sick shall recover. Some of you all need to lay hands on yourself. Lay Lay hands on your money. Lay hands on your children. Lay hands on your body. Do I have anybody that knows you got power? <laughs> Stop your neighbor, high five and say, did you feel it? Did you feel it? When Moses tried to release them, he stretched out his hands. When the Israelites were fighting the Amalekites, every time Moses' hands went up, they would win the battle. Any time his hand began to fall, they would start losing the battle. The problem is you forgot how powerful it is to lift up your holy hands in the sanctuary. When the enemy comes and tries to start tie your hands, you got to say, not my hands. These hands have chain-breaking power. I break every demonic chain, every demonic force, every demonic stronghold, every act of witchcraft, every Every divination, I break it in Jesus. Just lay hands on your neighbor and say, released. Yeah, yeah, released. Released. That's power. Power in your hands. That's, that's power in your hands. It's in your hands. You've been waiting on pastor to pray for you. You better lay hands on yourself. You've been waiting on somebody else to say something, Bob. You better lay hands on your own self. I'm healed by his stripes. I am delivered. I am the head, not the tail. I am above, not beneath. I am victorious. I am unstoppable. I'm unstoppable. Sit down, sit down, sit down, sit down. It's power in your hands. Even when they arrest you, even in this day and era, if you get arrested, they don't just immediately shackle your feet. They don't immediately tie your arms, but they tie your hands up because they figured out that if they leave your hands free, you'll be able to implement some damage upon them. So in order to protect themselves from you, the first thing that they do when they arrest you is they put handcuffs on you and they try to lock up your hands. Well, please understand that the devil has come in and he's tried to handcuff you, but he doesn't not have the authority you have the power you have a right not to remain silent you have a right to make some noise you have a right to declare your victory you have a right to stand on this promise do I have anybody that has their hands free I dare you to lose something in this Grab your neighbor by the hand. Grab him by the hand and say, I just need you to feel this power. I feel like deliverance is moving through the house. I feel the healing breaking through in this house. I feel breakthrough and anointing falling in this house. I just want you to feel this power. Sit down, sit down, sit down, sit down. Please sit down. Come on. My, 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 my. No, no, my, 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 my. Oh, bless your name, God. In the 20th chapter of John, the 20th chapter of John, the disciples had come to Jesus. And they had told Thomas, they said, Thomas, Jesus is back. 
He is alive. He is risen from the dead. Thomas said, I don't believe it. They said, no, Thomas, you got to believe us. There's eight of us and one of you. We ain't crazy. He said, no, I don't believe it. I ain't going to believe it until I can touch the nail prints in his hands. When Jesus heard about it and showed up at the house, he looked at Thomas and said, Thomas, this is what I need you to do. Take your finger and run it across the place where they nailed me in my hands. Then take your hand and run it across the place where they pierced me in the side. See, Jesus did that not just so that Thomas would believe that it was him, but what he wanted Thomas to do was feel his hands and feel with his own hands the place where they nailed him in the side. Why was that so important to Jesus? Because what he wanted Thomas to believe was not just that he was there, but he was there in spite of what they had done to him. He was there in spite of the dark room that they placed him in called his tomb. He was there in spite of the fact that the enemy said, this is it. We have defeated him. He wanted Thomas to believe. And at the conclusion of it, he says, Thomas, now that you've touched my hands and now that your hands have touched my side, I don't want you to ever doubt me again. Lord, I don't doubt that you are alive. He said, no, I don't want you to just not doubt that I'm alive, but I want to make sure that you don't doubt that I'm an overcomer and that everything that you ever deal with from this day forward it is in your own hands. You've got power and it's the proxy of what I've yielded from my divinity to your humanity. You You've got the capacity to do things that you wouldn't be able to do on your own. And don't worry about what it looks like. I've already, I've already overcome the world. So everything that you get into from this day forward, you can remember the nail prints in my hand. When they come and lie on you, just think about the nail prints in my hand. When they come to take you out just think about the nail prints in my hands and that I still made it despite what the devil said I made it, I made it I'm still here. Ah, bless your name, God. Let me back up for a minute and testify that even though they took his name and they drug it through the mud, even though they had chained his hands, and even though they chained his feet and put him in stockades, and even though, my God, my God, they locked him on the inside of the jail and they tried to rob him of his vision by putting him in a dark room. Let me get this straight, y'all. They dragged his name through the mud. They beat him on his back to break his wheel. They locked his hands up. They locked his feet up. But my God, my God, I figured out something about this thing. They made a few mistakes in the process. Oh, thank you, Jesus. They had built an edifice that they called the prison uh, and they built it with fortified walls and I imagine they used some metal, uh, some iron or some steel. Uh, They built this prison uh, to house every prisoner uh, and every person that they took captive, uh, every person that they wanted to lock up uh, and lock in. uh, They built this prison uh, and they caused the walls uh, to be in such a magnificent degree uh, of width and thickness that they could not bust out of them. And they placed a guard at the forefront of it and they determined within themselves that if this guard stands watch that there's no way that the prisoners will ever be able to get out of this situation. We've got them locked in and we've got them locked up. But the problem that they ran into is that they still even even though they were locked up, they had the ability, they had the presence of mind, they had the force.
foresight, they had the fortitude, they had the forethought to still look up. So even though the enemy might have your life locked up right now, I dare you to look up because even though they built this prison to keep you in, this is the mistake they made. The prison was strong enough to keep the prisoners in, but the prison wasn't strong enough to keep God out. But is there somebody in here that recognizes it's a jailbreak about to happen in this place? There's a jailbreak of the verge in this place. He's busting you out of the prison. He's busting you out of sickness. He's breaking you out of cancer. He's breaking you out of haters. There's a jailbreak about to take place in this place. If he can keep you in, he still can't keep my God out. I'm not worried about it because they made a treacherous mistake. But not only that, y'all, they made a critical error in their discernment and in their decisions. They drug his name through the mud. They locked his hands in chains. They put his feet in stockades. They beat him on his back to break his wheel. They locked him in a dark room, but they made one critical error. They forgot to cover his mouth. And now that his mouth is uncovered, he had the ability to take on the spirit of David and say, I Bless the Lord at all times. Your mouth is free today. And if you use your mouth, you can change the atmosphere. If you use your mouth, you can set the atmosphere. I can only imagine in my mind's eye that when they were speaking, when they were praying and singing, because they had an open mouth, they said, no weapon for against me uh, shall prosper. If God before me, uh, these chains can't be against me. Uh, I know who I am. Uh, I'm more than a conqueror because he loves me. Uh, here's the test. Uh, it's just a test. Uh, this is a test uh, of the emergency praise system. Uh, the devil has locked you up. Uh, he has locked up your future. He has locked up your children. Uh, he has locked up your grandchildren. He tried to lock up your mind. He tried to lock up your body. He tried to lock up your health. But I tell you right now, open your big mouth and bless the name of the Lord. Satan, I rebuke you. Satan, you're a liar. I'm already victorious. I'm already won. Somebody open your mouth. Shout in this place. Open your mouth. Bless him right now. I'm coming out and I'll be the one that's dancing. Shane's got to come off my feet. I'm coming out and I'll be the one with my hands up. Shane's got to let me go. I'm coming out. I'll be the one that's shouting. I made it. I made it. The devil is a liar. I will lift up my eyes. I made it. I made it. Or open your mouth and change the atmosphere. Or come on, change the atmosphere at home. Change the atmosphere. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. Open up your mouth and bless him. Something happens when you open your mouth. Change happens when you open your mouth. Demons tremble when you open your mouth and pray. Oh, let him hear the sound. Make the devil run and hide. Let him know that I got my mouth. As long as I got my mouth, I got my victory. Because God inhabits the praises of his people. Somebody give God a praise. I made it. I'm victorious. I'm more than a conqueror. I am healed. I am delivered. 
I am set free. The problem with some of you all is you are not like Paul and you haven't adopted the spirit of David. David said that I will bless the Lord not just sometimes, not just when it feels good, not just when I'm walking around in the sunshine of the day, not just on my good days, but even on my bad days. Do I have any all-time praises? You are having any all-star praises? I'm talking about people that are unstoppable, that are relentless, that are determined. Well, here's your chance. Serve the devil notice. You should have killed me when you had the chance. You had my hands locked up. You had my feet locked up. You had my name in the mud. You had me bent over. But I just came to my senses and I will bless the Lord. Pray the Lord, lift the Lord, thank the Lord, extol the Lord, lift your voice and make a joyful noise. He should have never let me get to the mic. You should have never let me get to the mic, devil. Now you got to run and hide because I just figured out what's going to happen. See, at the moment that I opened my mouth, stop has to change. Yeah, when God stepped out of eternity and looked at what was absolutely nothing, when the earth was void and without form, he said with his mouth, let there be. And things became. When, when Jesus stepped into the room of Jairus' daughter, he didn't just look at the girl, but he grabbed her by the hand and he used his mouth. He said to lift a coon, little girl rise. When he stepped out on the bow of the ship and they were caught up in the middle of a storm, he didn't just look at the storm, but he opened up his mouth and said, peace be. When he stepped in front of the tomb of Lazarus, he didn't just look at the tomb, but he spoke to the tomb and Lazarus, come, open up your mouth. Something has to change. Things have to turn around. Problems have to leave you alone. Depression has to get out of your life. Open your mouth. My God, my God. My God, my God. Watch this. Come on, my time is way over. Come on. The Bible says there was an earthquake. But it happened suddenly. Here's the misconception. Some of us think just because I came to Victory this morning or I tuned in on the internet. And I praise God. And I open my mouth and I believe the word. That suddenly means right now we don't know how long they had to worship before suddenly showed up we don't know how long they had prayer meeting the bible didn't say that they worshiped at midnight and at 1205 suddenly showed up we don't know how long before suddenly shows up but what we do know is that they praise God long enough. Hey! Suddenly showed up. Some of you don't figured it out just yet. You're one thank you Jesus away. You're one glory to God away. You're one bless your name away. You're one hallelujah away. Somebody bless him until suddenly. I feel a breakthrough in this room. I feel a breakthrough in this room. Somebody's about to get your promotion. Somebody's about to get that house. I feel a suddenly on the way. God's about to blow your mind. Don't look at your neighbor. Look up and bless your God. Don't look at your circumstance. Look up and praise your God.
<laughs> I'm trying to hurry up, I promise. When suddenly showed up, the Bible says that the earthquake disrupted the foundation of the prison to the extent that all the doors flew open. Y'all missed it, so let me help you out. The Bible didn't say that because Paul and Silas was worshiping, praying and praising God, that the earthquake shook the foundation and opened their doors. The Bible said that Some of y'all got a contact today. Some of y'all got a contact blessing. Just because you sat on the row with a praiser, the doors of your life are about to... I'm coming out. I'm coming out of it. I'm coming out. You better be glad you sat by me today. Your deliverance is tied to my praise. Your breakthrough is tied to my praise. You better be. I promise I'm trying to quit. I promise I'm trying to leave it alone. Watch this. Here's the challenge. Just because the door is open didn't mean that they could get out because they were still in chains. So not only did all the doors open, but the Bible said all the chains It's not enough for you to be here today and God to open the door. Some of you have your minds chained in Egypt. Be not conformed to the thinking of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Watch this. I promise I'm trying, y'all. I'm trying to get off of this, but somebody is getting what you need. I sense, perceive, I discern in my spirit, somebody at home, you're about to walk into a season of unstoppable faith and favor, and the devil has tried to lock you up, but today this word has literally shaken the foundation of your world, and the doors that were locking you out, they are now having to open up and let you come in. Not only the chains fall off, not, watch this, when this happened, God gives extraordinary restoration if, if, you, if you recall for just a, just a moment if you recall that they tried to <laughs> they tried to arrest them with hands and feet because they were trying to steal their authority and kill their power so the chains shook loose which restored their authority and power the God came running in watch this this is the God that was charged with keeping them in darkness. But because of the extraordinary move of God, because of the prayers and the praise and because of the shaking of the foundation, because of the chains coming off, because the doors flew open, when the God realized what had happened and saw all the doors open, the Bible says that he called for the lights. So the same person that was responsible for keeping them in darkness. God flipped the script and used the same enemy to bring light to their dark situation. Your enemies are going to have to bless you and they're not even going to understand why they got to do it. But let me tell you, he will make your enemy your thy prepare it's a table before me even in the present y'all got time uh, so watch this 
not only did they call for the lights restore the lights the guard was told to release Paul and Silas once they figured out they made a mistake that they were actually Roman citizens they were treated less than Roman citizens but once they realized their mistake they said go let them out Paul said mm -mm. no 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 you drug my name through the mud you treated me less than a Roman citizen you treated me like I was less than and you brought me in here in the daylight so you ain't gonna sneak me out of here in the cover of darkness but the same way that you tried to take me down is the same way that I'm gonna walk out of here with my name restored something happened when the earthquake came the jailer knew that he was going to face the penalty of death from his superiors and it probably would have been more brutal than even he taking his own life so he decided oh my god I was supposed to guard the prison the doors are open they all gone right before he's about to take his life Paul shouts out stop stay your hand don't do it we're still here we're still here some of y'all got that testimony we're still here stop don't worry about me I'm still here you meant it for evil but don't worry about me God flipped it and turned it I'm still here don't worry about what it looked like I'm still here